Our next guest adventures will take you on a journey like no other. Throughout her unconventional career, she's reached places on the planet where nobody had before. She's a veteran cave diver who spends her days swimming through channels in volcanoes or inside cracks of the world's largest icebergs. She's worked with scientists to help discover new species, explored Canada's great north, and uncovered remains of ancient civilizations. Plunging into the beautiful world of travel and discovery with us is famed explorer Jill Heinerth. Thanks for joining me on the Northern Take, Jill. It's good to be here with you today. I know that you grew up near Toronto. Had you always been fascinated by exploration and science? Oh, yeah. I think you would call me a a curious kid. And I mean, when I was really young, watching the Apollo missions on TV was was the thing that really sort of set my imagination on fire. People always talk about Jacques Cousteau. Did he have any influence on you or, or were you even aware of him as a youngster? Oh, Jacques Cousteau had a huge influence on me. I mean, as a, as a kid, we had yeah. two television channels, right? So on Sunday nights, we would uh, be in, in the den in the house eating dinner. It was the one night that we didn't have to eat around the kitchen table. So, so that was totally fun. Uh, but also, you know, because we had two TV channels, that meant that everybody had a common media experience. Yeah. So you'd go to school and you'd talk about Jacques Cousteau the next morning. Um, so it inspired me, but, but all of my friends too. Now, how do you go from watching Jacques Cousteau on Sunday to actually becoming a professional cave diver? Well, it's one slow step at a time, really. It doesn't happen overnight. In fact, some of my friends say I'm a a 30-year overnight success, right? (laughs) (laughs) I spent my childhood dreaming about being a diver, and I I did everything else from, you know, swimming lessons to canoeing and synchronized swimming and water polo, but I still dreamt about being a diver. And I guess the aha moment happened like I was I was working at my advertising company sitting at my drafting table and I just knew that I didn't <laughs> want to work indoors. I had to find a way to get out. I was teaching scuba nights and weekends and I wanted to turn my hobby, my passion into the career. Um, and so I needed to convert my creative living into an underwater creative living. I know what that feeling feels like when you find something that you can, you just feel at home. And I really wish that I had that same level of connection with being underwater because I've been trying for 30 years just to get comfortable and find my place. But what is a professional cave diver? Break it down for us. Sure. I mean, it's an unusual career. Really, I had to create it in a way. Yeah. So I just focus all of my attention on doing things that allow me to stay in the water. So I'm a writer. I'm an underwater cinematographer, photographer, um, consultant, instructor, a public speaker. All of these activities help me to, uh, to stay underwater. Now, I'm swimming through overhead environments like caves that are filled with water beneath your feet. And even, you know, that alone is very abstract for a lot of people to imagine. Uh, But it's an opportunity for me to be able to go to places where nobody has ever been before. Jill, I'm honestly terrified of everything that it is that you're saying right now. And I've read that more people have died underwater in caves than have summiting Mount Everest. What is the draw for you? Oh, yeah, there's not a day that goes by that I don't have to think about that. I mean, I've lost over a hundred friends to Whoa. cave and technical diving accidents. Yeah, it's it's terrible. So I have to be an expert at dealing with risk and I have to be vigilant and unwavering about the safety protocols that I follow to, to keep myself safe and get home at the end of the day. Wow. Uh, that, uh, that left a mark. A hundred people. Good Lord. Uh, yeah. Now, people like me that are afraid of the ocean, uh, it's obviously for just reason, and it, it is because mm-hmm. so much of it is unknown to us. What do you say to them? Well, I mean, we can all overcome our fears. I, mean, I think that like stepping into the darkness towards things that scare us is the essence of what it is to be an explorer and to engage in discovery. So I really think that that's what drives society forward. When I swim through caves, I feel like I'm swimming through the veins of Mother Earth. I mean, I'm in oh, the wow. lifeblood of the planet, that very, you know, sustenance that is is serving humanity and wildlife and the environment. And uh, it, it's just an incredible thing to be in the body of the planet. Uh, I love those words that you're speaking. That is cool. Jill, you once said that you wanted to be an astronaut. 
And although you're not an astronaut now, you mm-hmm. are an aquanaut. Do you see yourself this way? You know, it might even be better. I, I would still go yeah. to the moon if someone offered me a ticket. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Every year, I actually write a letter to Richard Branson and ask him if, you know, if he ever needs anyone to go on. I'd really like to take some pictures of the big blue planet. <laughs> but for me, yeah, being an aquanaut with an opportunity to explore and map places that nobody's ever been before, I don't think there's very many ways that you can do this on this planet anymore. So I, I just pinch myself every day. I'm doing what I love. And I've read that you've discovered new species. Are you discovering new sharks uh, or things that we didn't even know the planet had? What are we talking about? Well, as, a, as an expert cave diver, I'm collaborating with a lot of different scientists and I'm extending their reach, becoming their hands and eyes in the environment. So I work sure. with you know, biologists, paleontologists, archaeologists, climate change scientists and, and everything else. And so I've had a, the privilege to work with marine biologists who are documenting life that live within the darkness of these underwater caves. Really cool, interesting, small animals that never see the light of day. Some of these crustaceans that live in the caves have like venomous fangs and pincers and they can attack something 40 times their size. They can neutralize it, turn its guts into jello and then suck the life out of it over time. So like there's this one animal called remipede and if he was the size of a cat, he would be the most dangerous thing on the planet. No way. That is like another planet. When you're in these underwater caves and you're exploring, it must feel like you've entered another world, another realm from which maybe we came. Uh, That has to leave a mark on your impression of the planet when you get back up to the surface, does it not? Oh, absolutely. I mean, these caves are virtually museums of natural history. So we can learn about Earth's past climate. We can learn about the animals that live in the caves. We can find the remains of past civilizations that have used these as portals to their underworld. When I'm inside a cenote, like a a cave well in Mexico, and finding the remains of the Mayan civilization, I feel like I'm going back in time. I'm seeing evidence of when they dealt with drought and you know, food scarcity and different ocean levels and became desperate and sort of disbanded from the great overpopulated cities. So yeah, I do feel like some of the things that we come across are cautionary tales, whether it's that archaeology or whether it's the the signs of climate change that I see in the north um, when I'm traveling to the Arctic. Um, There's definitely a lot that Mother Nature can teach us. What do you think the most pressing water issue facing our planet is today? Is it uh, the scarcity of fresh water or is it the maybe the desalinization of our oceans? It's, it's everything. I mean, we're certainly overusing our clean, fresh drinking water resources. But in terms of the ocean, I'm concerned about acidification. I'm concerned about the plastification of the ocean. I mean, the oceans are the lungs of our planet. You know, one out of every two breaths that we take is provided by the ocean. And um, if we, you know, keep allowing our, our climate to shift as it is, uh, then that's going to Um, damage some of that uh, opportunity for the ocean to create the oxygen that we breathe. So I'm definitely, you know, concerned about about what I'm seeing and the changes that I've seen in my 30 plus years underwater. You know, the coral reefs um, become bleached. I've seen the color of the water change from turquoise blue to algae filled green. I've seen the loss of native species and an increase in Um, non-native species. But I think the most profound changes I do see are actually in the north where the sea ice is changing like year to year when I visit. It's getting thinner. It's setting up later each year. It's breaking up earlier each year. And that that sea ice that the indigenous people call the land is changing. And so will their lives and all of the animals that rely on that sea ice. Have you had some pretty epic experiences diving in the north as well? Oh, yes. I mean, I think one of my favorite places to go is the flow edge, the place where the sea ice meets the ocean. It's hard to get to, especially with the ice thinning and and with the sort of seasons changing each year. But when we get to the flow edge, it it breaks up every day and it, it moves back, you know, a mile or two per day as the summer warms up. But the animals come to the flow edge like it's a buffet restaurant. All the life is concentrated there. So I get to see narwhals and beluga whales, humpbacks, 
bowhead whales, polar bears, just incredible life. Well, we've mentioned the north. Where would your mm-hmm. other favorite places in our country be to dive? Well, I love going to Newfoundland, to Belle Island, where I dive on shipwrecks that were sunk in 1942 by German U-boats. And then out west, I love, you know, swimming with the stellar sea lions and the California sea lions off Vancouver Island. So there's so much. I mean, I think really, truly my favorite place to dive in the whole world is Canada. We have so much to offer. And I have to imagine that the sea lions that you experience on the west coast are a little more ominous than the shipwrecks on the east coast is that is that fair to say no i I would actually say the shipwrecks are more ominous just because of the history behind them i mean they're war graves but the sea lions it's kind of a combination of like you roll off the boat and the sea lions like like if they could gallop they're galloping towards you they're rushing (laughs) towards you in a pack sometimes sometimes 20 or 30 of them and it's halfway between a pack of puppies in a bar fight because they're yeah. pulling and yanking <laughs> on like I've had them steal my buddy's fins I've had them grab my head and pull me to the surface and about a year ago I had them like bite into my shoulder and it didn't injure me but it did puncture my dry suit in cold water and flood me completely in February in uh, in BC <laughs> oh that's got to be a wild start to the old system is it not it was but I was having so much fun. I put up with it for almost an hour before I got out because I knew I wouldn't be doing a second dive that day with a destroyed suit. (laughs) Oh, that's so awesome. And you know what? Newfoundland has gotten a lot of love on this program from its people to its scenery and now to its shipwrecks. I want to go back to that for a second and talk about Mm -hmm. what it's like because you mentioned it yourself that it is uh, a war grave. It must be a bag of mixed emotions when you're when you're there experiencing it, is it not? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, right now the environment is beautiful. I mean, you could see a stern gun completely intact on the the back of a ship um, that never got a chance to fire a shot. And today it's covered with sea life, colorful soft corals. And from the end of the gun, there are these anemones sprouting out. So instead of a, you know, fusillade of, of artillery, you're getting this bloom of colorful anemones. So it's almost like nature's healing that. And There are quite remarkable stories of the local people like, you know, paddling out to rescue uh, the men in the water when the uh, when the ships were torpedoed. So I've had a very great bond with the local people there and some of the descendants of of the people from those wrecks and the descendants of the rescuers. So I love Newfoundland. It's an incredible place. Before you became a world renowned technical diver, you were a diver instructor in Tobermory on the Bruce Peninsula in Ontario. What can people experience while diving on the Bruce Peninsula? You know, I was teaching scuba nights and weekends, and it seemed like every Friday I was getting out of Toronto as fast as I could to get up to that beautiful place to uh, to teach new divers and give them their first experiences in the water. And, you know, we do dives on wrecks like uh, the sweepstakes and the tugboats that are very close to shore and dive in these beautiful, clear waters off the lighthouse point. So... There are so many places up there to experience, whether you're a diver or just a swimmer, too. The Bruce Peninsula is the end of the Niagara Escarpment in Ontario, and so you can hike the Bruce Trail all the way to Tobermory. So it's this beautiful limestone cliffs. And if you're out on the water on a glass bottom boat tour at sunset, then you'll look and see this beautiful high Uh, escarpment just illuminated by the setting sun and very very clear waters a lot of people take a boat and go out to a place called flower pot island where they see these massive columns of limestone rising up out of the water Uh, but there's just a lot of outdoor activities so people have a chance to hike or go snorkeling or even try scuba for the first time and uh, it's really fun to see people doing new things and 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 just unmitigated joy. I didn't know that we had that down there. That's fascinating. Jill, it says that you were the first Canadian in history to plunge deep into an iceberg in Antarctica. Please walk me through this. What are we talking about here? So I was the very first person to go cave diving inside an iceberg, period. And I did it in Antarctica about 20 years ago when the largest iceberg in recorded history calved away from the Ross Ice Shelf. So this was an iceberg the size of Jamaica. And my (laughs) colleagues and I hypothesized, 
that there would be caves inside the ice and we wanted to go down there, intercept the iceberg and be the first people to cave dive into conduits tunnels inside the ice. And I really wanted to go to Antarctica and I knew I had to have a pretty good pitch <laughs> to get National Geographic interested. And it did. They were blown away. They're like, what? There are caves inside of icebergs? And my partner and I are like, oh, yeah, there's caves inside of icebergs. <laughs> but truthfully, we didn't know. We really didn't know until we got there. And it was a it was a 12-day sea crossing from New Zealand to the Ross Ice Shelf. I mean, that in and of itself was unbelievably dangerous with up to 60-foot seas and ice freezing on the top of the ship. And we really went on a bit of a wing and a prayer. Then what happens? What is it like when you go down there? Are you, you know, descending down a frozen wall like we'd experience in Game of Thrones? Or is it just black like night? What are you experiencing when you're under the water? Well, the icebergs themselves are beautiful. So you can imagine that like icebergs are formed because like layers of snow and ice over years are compacted um, and they slowly run downhill basically break off into the sea so there are layers that are transparent some that are like white and filled with bubbles but they all are carved by the hand of the sea so the surface of the ice looks like like a giant sized golf ball with little divots kind of thing and when we found our first major cave down there we entered into a crevasse so there's there's ice on either side of me and i'm going into this entrance way and it drops down into the blackness and i'm just going down 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 Ooh. until we found some places where we could start to move laterally like into the iceberg and then even down to places where the iceberg kind of tripped up on the seafloor and where it did that it actually protected these beautiful little ecosystems of filter feeding organisms and it was it was like being on another planet it it was just remarkable, everything that we saw there. Well, it, it sounds intense, scary, but ultimately really fascinating. Were there any mm -hmm. close calls while you were down there? Anything that would be, well, anxiety inducing for a guy like me? Everything was anxiety inducing. <laughs> so <laughs> there was one dive where the entrance that we had gone into literally calved. Um, and a large piece of ice blocked the doorway that we'd gone into, and we had to find another way out around the big blocks of ice that had just broken apart. Uh, and the very last dive we did in Antarctica, it was getting very close, well, it was the full moon night, and the tides uh, got stronger, and we were inside the iceberg when the current reversed on us and picked up at an incredible velocity that was so strong we were pulling ourselves across the seafloor trying to get out of the iceberg and we turned a one hour dive into three hour literal fight for our lives to escape that current and when i finally got back to the boat that day i, I really had thought that we weren't coming home and the chief scientist was like beside himself because we were over two hours late and he thought that we were gone you know and he looked down and he's like what happened and and I said, wow, Greg, the, the cave tried to keep us today. Wow. Will you ever go back into an iceberg in Antarctica? Please tell me no. <laughs> well, I have continued iceberg diving, um, never to the extent of that expedition. And I'm certainly more cautious. Uh, but every year when I go back to Newfoundland, I, I have a little encounter with iceberg diving. It's usually not in the iceberg, but uh, sure. still beside the iceberg is dangerous <laughs> enough to... So when work is over and, and you're done traveling for your professional reasons, do you ever leave the wetsuit at home and just go on a normal vacay? Well, you know, it's funny because my husband's always like, can we just go to the grocery store without it being an expedition, honey? <laughs> but um, we don't have like normal vacations. Like, the, like there was one trip we decided to do when my husband was begging me to take a break from diving. And he said, what have you always wanted to do? Like what's been left like unfulfilled from childhood? And I said, well, I'd really like to ride my bike across Canada. Do you want to do it? And he's like, does it have to be so hard? You know, I thought you were going to say like, go away for a weekend. <laughs> so, so we did. We rode our bikes from um, Vancouver to St. John's, Newfoundland. The reverse trip, as I'll call it. Terry Fox went the other way, and you're going from Vancouver out to That's Newfoundland. That's right. Yeah, we finished at the Terry Fox Monument. Yeah. No way. 
We did. And when I got there, I mean, the magnitude of the trip just uh, completely humbled me. And then reading all of the inscriptions, uh, quotes from Terry Fox, I was just, I, I was on my knees crying. <laughs> you know, It was just such a moment in my life I'll never forget. Newfoundland became a second family to me <laughs> after going there. Uh, but we had so many beautiful experiences on our bike trip. Like, like in Regina, we left a, our wallet on a Tim Hortons table at breakfast and cycled more than 100 kilometers before we realized that the wallet with the passport and all of the money for our trip, like $3,000 cash, was sitting like on a table. And someone heard us sort of freaking out when we realized it. And this woman picked up my husband and drove him back to Regina, 100 kilometers to pick up his wallet, which was still there with everything inside it, and then brought him back to me and returned back to Regina because that's where she lived. So she made a 300 plus kilometer drive that day to help us out. So there's so many places where I've had these beautiful human experiences all across the country. And and then in the North, just, oh man, uh, I, I can't get that out of my out of my soul like standing on the hillside in pond inlet and looking across to bylot island and seeing what looks exactly like a lauren harris group of seven painting oh. um wow you know we're so blessed as canadians the types of imagery that you're painting in my mind's eye right now is uh, like one of these paintings standing in front of it what do you think it is about canadians that allows them to see people life in this context there's so much kindness in Canada. Maybe it's because a lot of people live through adversity or in tough climates or difficult places, but everybody's always willing to give you the shirt off their back when you're traveling and uh, they'll share everything. They'll share their wisdom. They'll share their food. They'll, you know, even if it's their last bite. And uh, I, I'm so proud, proud to be a Canadian. Well, we have lots of people to be proud of here in Canada, uh, one of them being James Cameron, a, a brilliant Hollywood director and movie producer. You've actually had the privilege to be able to work with him. What was that experience like and how did that come to happen? Oh, my gosh. He is such a hard worker and really yep. very inspirational. So much of his Hollywood work has all been done in the service of underwater exploration that he really loves. So I had a chance to take him on his very first cave dives and uh, to work with him on a pitch trailer for the movie Sanctum. And he is the hardest working guy I think I've ever met. But he's also, like me, just filled with wonder, the wonder of experiences. And he's just constantly kind of soaking it in and obviously enjoying what he does. What makes him a hard worker? He's unstoppable. I remember uh, working on this pitch trailer. We were underwater probably for eight hours before <laughs> before we had a chance to have some food. Like any time we needed a tank fill, we weren't even getting out of the water. We were literally like swimming to these steps and someone was giving us a new tank. But when it was finally time to eat, we swam to the steps and I thought we were going to get out of the water. But instead, someone brought a box of pizza to us and I, <laughs> in the water, chest deep, ate my pizza with James Cameron. So that's my very favorite picture that I have with him. It just seems so crazy. So yeah, he's he's got unending energy. It's obviously been a super challenging year uh, for everybody mm -hmm. and it's disrupted travel plans. What mm -hmm. have you been doing to fill that travel void that has been created in your life? Well, I've been doing a lot of volunteer work. So I am exploring Canada's longest underwater cave near Ottawa and working with um, a scientist from the Canadian Museum of Nature, a scientist that's not a cave diver. And I've uh, found that this cave is filled with endangered species that are just absolutely blowing his mind. So it's, it's, there's lots to do, lots to explore. And uh, I'm very fortunate that I've been able to continue with interesting projects here at home. And so when you do get to resume normal travel again, what are some of your expeditions that are on your plate that you are going to be undertaking? Well, I've had to sort of postpone some of my work um, in Newfoundland, but I'm looking forward to getting back there to uh, document a couple more shipwrecks. And I also have a project in the Arctic that I missed out on this summer because none of us wanted to be that, you know, vector that could potentially take COVID to none of it. Um, but next summer, I hope to get back there if everything's clear. And I'm really interested in doing audio recordings of the animals under the ice because it's it's 
it's incredible the sounds that they make and I really want to create a piece of music like a symphony oh. a requiem for sea ice um, with the sounds of those animals well that sounds awesome is it that loud and audible it is absolutely mind-blowing it sounds like another world so um, beluga whales sound like canaries they chirp and they sing uh, narwhals click their teeth in different rhythms and vibrations to communicate ring seals and bearded seals make these trills that go several octaves from high to low that just sound like ghostly eerie beings under the ice uh, so it's super super loud like on top of the ice you just hear the wind and and blowing snow but underwater it's a cacophony have you ever been face to face with a beluga or a narwhal I have, yeah. They're super, super curious. So at the Flow Edge, I was um, filming uh, a movie called Under Thin Ice for the Nature of Things. We were snorkeling the first day that we saw them, and uh, these belugas were, like, I swear they were playing with me. I would, would spin around and try and catch them, and they were staying just on the verge of visibility, and I'd think that they weren't there anymore, and then I'd hear someone yell from the ice, it's behind you, and I'd wheel around, and sure enough, the beluga was kind of like, you know, <laughs> <laughs> behind me, and uh, just sort of playing cat and mouse. So they were, they were camera shy, I suppose. <laughs> playing tag with a beluga with a snorkel on, what's the deepest that you've ever gone? Oh, uh, well, about 460 feet deep, so pretty deep. <laughs> what tips do you have for newbies like myself who want to develop some sense of ease in the water and, and, and discover mm -hmm. things? Well, I mean, whether you snorkel or whether you choose to scuba dive, there's so much to see, even in just the shallow water. And, you know, kids as young as 10 can start scuba diving classes now and do some online training and pool sessions before they go to do open water dives. And there's, you know, dive schools all across Canada where, uh, where they can learn to do that. Um, and I guess I would just tell anyone that don't be afraid of what you don't under understand yep. yet. So you'll be given the tools and the techniques in order to experience this new world. And, uh, and if it catches you by the heart, then you'll, then you'll stay with it. Good advice for all aspects of life, not just diving. Jill, if you are game, I'd like to play a little game. And this is the part on the Northern Take where we will give you a question. And in a rapid fire sort of response, I want you to say the first thing that pops into your mind. Are you ready? Sure, go for it. Okay. The one Canadian thing that you can't live without. Maple syrup. Yeah, not the first time we've heard that answer either. And for good reason. Okay. Oh, <laughs> yep. The one place in Canada that everybody should visit. Oh, Newfoundland. Yeah. Now, a Canadian that you most admire. Uh, I would say... Joe McInnes and Roberta Bondar. So there's two. For their explorations and exploits or because of personal qualities? Both, actually, yeah. Uh, Joe McGinnis for all his accomplishments as a diving explorer and, and all of the contributions he's made as a, as a medical doctor in, in both diving and space medicine. And Roberta Bondar, obviously, as the the first uh, female astronaut. We, we had dinner together once and I, and I realized that she was the highest female Canadian and I was the deepest female Canadian. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> I really wish I yeah. could have been there just to listen to the conversation that you guys would have had at that particular dinner. Fascinating. And finally, what makes you the proudest to be called a Canadian? I just think it's the integrity of, of Canadians. It's, you know, the fact that we kind of have and, and embrace a social contract and we care about each other, take care of each other. So I, I really think it's, yeah, the kindness and the integrity of Canadians. And that's something that I'm proud of in us for sure. Jill, thank you for your time here today. I know for a fact that you've inspired me to get off my seat and to approach some of these fears that I have about water. So thank you for being that little bit of inspiration that we all needed to get out of our own way and to go after what we most want in life today. Jill, thank you very much for being with us on The Northern Take. Oh, my pleasure. And when you're ready to jump in the water in Tobermory, just look me up. I'll uh, make it happen. <laughs> I tell you what, <laughs> don't say stuff you don't mean. <laughs> Jill, thanks so much again. My pleasure. That's it for this episode of The Northern Take. I'm John Montgomery, and thanks so much for taking your time to journey with us. 